China returned to outer space on Friday, launching its largest ever launch vehicle and satellite into orbit. How long before the Chinese built their first space station and even land on Mars? Meanwhile, back on Earth, one Chinese video blogger has soared to fame by presenting her rural life to millions of fans. What explains her unlikely popularity? Well, welcome to The Point, an opinion show coming to you live from Beijing. I'm Li Chouyuan, sitting in for Liu Xin. So on Friday, China achieved another milestone in its space program, successfully launching its largest carrier rocket into space. Some 36 minutes later, the Long March 5 then launched China's largest ever satellite into orbit. And just as significant as this achievement, perhaps, was its symbolism, which is set to set sights on even more ambitious projects, like a mission to Mars, studying moon samples, and building China's own space station one day. So why is China's progress in space so significant? And how would the West, particularly the United States, respond to this intensifying competition? Well, joining our discussion in the Beijing studio here is Professor Yang Yuguang of the China Aerospace Science and Industry Group. And from Denver, Dr. Andrew Aldrin, director of the Aldrin Space Institute at Florida Institute of Technologies. Thank you so much for joining us to you both. So, the first Long March 5 rocket was uh, successfully launched more than three years ago on November 3, 2016. But the second Long March 5 rocket suffered a great setback on July 2nd, uh, 2017, when it malfunctioned less than six minutes after takeoff. So, with that in mind, Friday night's launch of the third Long March 5 was actually the first since that technical failure. So, Professor Yao, let me start with you. Ta talk to us about why this mission is so significant for China's space program. What have it achieved? Uh, and what will it achieve later? Well, uh, Long March 5, Long March 6, and Long March 7 belongs to China's new generation of launch vehicle series. The most significant feature of this series is that it uses uh, environmental friendly propellants, the liquid oxygen, the li liquid hydrogen, and the kerosene. Well, Long March 5 is the biggest one in this series and the most important one because in the future uh, we will have our manned station programs. Each of the module of the station have a mass of more than 20 tons. The Tianhe core module, the Wentian experimental module, and the Mengtian experimental module uh, can only be launched into orbit by this Long March 5 series. Actually speaking, Long March 5B, it is another derivative of this Long March 5. Mm -hmm. And also next year, you know, that's the launch window for each Mars mission uh, need to wait for about, about 26 months. If we miss the launch window next year, we will need to have to wait for another two years. So next year, we will be our Mars mission. It will combine a rover, a lander, and an orbiter together, which is the first time uh, in the world that combine these three uh, tasks together. Uh, so this is also a very important task. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, that's because you, you, the failure you mentioned uh, in 2017, our uh, Chang'e 5, or the sample return mission from the moon, is also delayed. So next year, maybe uh, by the end of the year, we will also perform this mission. So these are very important missions for China to become, a fu in the future, an advanced country. So Mars mission is coming. Uh, Dr. Roger, let me bring you into this. How are you looking at it? How do you think, how significant a step this is for, for China and its space program? Well, I think it's an, um, it's an element of what we've seen as tremendous progress on the part of China um, in becoming really a, um, a very respectable spacefaring nation. And so I think the introduction is Dr. Yang said of the whole family of vehicles is particularly significant. Um, and I think that um, Mars is going to be a very interesting area, but uh, it's my belief that I think the most interesting part of, of space development over the next couple of decades is probably going to come more in the area of commercial space. Hmm. Now, regarding the July 2017 malfunction, Professor Yang, how did China's aerospace experts eventually detect what went wrong with the engine, and why did it take this much time between <coughs> the second and uh, third launch? Well, this is a really, really uh, long story and a painful, full of struggle. You see, that's, there are many new technologies we used on this Long March 5 
uh, launch vehicle. Usually, for a new launch vehicle, it should not have uh, new technologies more than 30 percent. But for this Long March 5, we have almost 90 percent of the technology we used are new. So uh, there are, we, we must be facing many uh, technical challenges. Uh, there are two in major concerns. One is that the diameter is five meters. We never, we China have never launched a launch vehicle with this uh, big di diameter. And the second is comes from the challenge of the uh, rocket engine or the propulsion system. You see that the uh, why. F-77, the engine used by the core, uh, core stage of this Long March 5 is the largest uh, uh, engine built by China using hy liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. Mm -hmm. The uh, turbo pump used by this, uh, by this engine is a key part of this engine and it failed during the second launch attempt. So we need mm -hmm. to find what it is. And the, the, the bad thing is that because we don't have much data uh, or the telemetry, telemetry data from the uh, second launch, so mm -hmm. if we even use the underwater vehicle to uh, try to find the debris, but it does not work. So uh, we have to uh, work very properly and very carefully about what happened during this failure and also to find the uh, what we call the failure mode uh, during many, many enormous uh, ground tests. And uh, we have the, uh, actually speaking, we have the plans to launch this uh, third launch vehicle uh, almost half a year before. But at that moment, we also find some uh, small malfunction and we need another improvement. So this is why we launched this uh, launch vehicle after about 908 days. Now, China is one more step closer to its greater ambitions, like Professor Yang just mentioned, a mission to Mars, or to bring back and study moon samples and to build China's first space station. So, Professor Yang, again, um, talk to us how realistic is each of these three goals and what are the challenges we're facing now? Well, each of these goals are not easy. Uh, for instance, uh, during the, the first half of next year, we will have the test launch of Long March 5B which is a derivative of Long March 5. You know that Long March 5 is a two and a half stage rocket and Long March 5B is a one and a half stage rocket, which is uh, completely dedicated to lower orbit uh, objects. But it cannot, we, we cannot recognize the Long March 5B is as, uh, as a simple advanced version of the Long March 5. We still have many uh, technical challenges and it is also very risky. So only after this test launch, we can launch the, uh, the, uh, the core modules of the China space station. And for the Mars mission, launch itself, the launch itself is a very difficult one and also you know that until now only the United States have successfully uh, landed on Mars and uh, performed scientific research. So uh, after maybe uh, more than half a year the landing procedure uh, to the Mars is also a very great, uh, great challenge and uh, have very uh, great risk for us. And Dr. Aldrin, what kind of challenges have Americans been facing uh, with its space program? Might the Chinese be facing the same? Um, well, Dr. Yang again is correct that landing on Mars has been very challenging. I think the first few decades of missions were marked by more failures than successes. So it's challenging and I think this is a really great opportunity um, for China to contribute to global science uh, regarding, uh, regarding Mars and I think where it gets really interesting is the possibilities of perhaps um, lunar exploration and exploitation of lunar resources as well. Now, in 2015, China State Council published a landmark document that stated, quote, outer space has become the new commanding heights in international strategic competition. Countries concerned are developing their space forces and instruments, and the first signs of weaponization of outer space have appeared. Uh, quite an interesting statement. Professor Yang, why has space become such a priority for China now? How does the Chinese public view these ambitions? Do they support such investments? Well, I think this lies in several facts. First, that is space is very important. It's already become more and more important for the national economy. Our navigation satellite constellation, our communication satellites, our Earth observation, Earth observation satellites can provide uh, very useful ways for increasing, uh, improving our daily life and in, uh, for uh, do contribution for the economic growth. And also, the space technology is very critical, very important for big countries like China to improve its high technology field and, uh, and also the space Space science is also a very important field for, uh, for scientists. So I think the space field, uh, comprehensively speaking, is a very important field for a big country. So uh, it is, a stra uh, it is uh, strategically important. But on the other hand, uh, we do not want to see the weaponize of the, of the space. We hope that all countries can use the uh, space, the outer space, peacefully. 
And Dr. Aldrin, how is the U.S. viewing this, mm -hmm. uh, China's space mission, and how should they view it? I think the United States views it, I, I can't speak for the U.S. leadership, but I can speak for myself, which is this is a natural progression of, of China. As they grow as a nation, as their economy grows, it's only natural that their space programs would grow and, and become, I think, a positive contributor to um, activities in space in general. I, I will say that with respect to national security activities, space w will always be an important domain um, for communications um, and for information gathering. And I think that's actually a stabilizing technology. So it's very important that, that, that nations have these capabilities and it's reasonable that China would develop its own capabilities, um, you know, for GPS, for, um, for communications and earth observation in space. And Dr. Audrin, you are a longtime first-hand observer of the U.S. space program and also the son of one of America's most famous astronauts, Buzz Aldrin. I mean, how do you feel President Donald Trump's newly created Space Force? So I think what the Space Force is is really just a reorganization of existing um, people within the Department of Defense. So it's frankly... Um, more of a bureaucratic move than anything else. It really doesn't change any budgets. It doesn't change anything that's being done. So to me, it kind of has, I, I think, received an awful lot more attention than it really deserves. Um, should China view this development with concern, Professor Young? Well, um, it is, I, for, for my view and from most of my colleagues' view, it is really a pity that uh, uh, have a um, space force. That means, uh, as I mentioned, the weapon rise of the outer space. Uh, so, uh, but uh, to my, uh, from, from my view as a technician, usually you see uh, the manned space flight. In the early ages, there were many uh, military applications, but uh, after the uh, MIR uh, program and uh, now the International Space Station, it proves that uh, it is a better way to use the, utilize the space uh, peacefully. And also the International Space Station gives us a very good e example. Although you, you see that the former Soviet Union and the U.S. have very intensive uh, competition during the Cold War, but now they can cooperate together. I think in the future it is also possible, although there are many prejudices, uh, especially in the U.S. Congress, but I think it is really possible for us to cooperate in the future. Uh, Andrew, Dr. Andrew Aldrin and I are not only colleagues in the International Astronautical Federation, but we are also colleagues in the Moon Village Association. We hope we can work together in the future for this peaceful usage of the outer space. There are room for cooperation, but about the concept of space competition. I mean, some suggest that China's steady, even rapid progress is part of some, quote, um, a land grab in outer space. And one element of a broader, more aggressive competition with the U.S. for space dominance. Professor Yang, do you give any uh, credence uh, to this claim? What's behind such speculation? Well, it's complex. You see that competition to some uh, uh, circumstances is good, especially in commercial competition, because commercial competition, you see, it can brought innovation and also sometimes brings high efficiency. But I think uh, the competition during the space race is not a reasonable one. Uh, so the former Soviet Union and USA wants to be the first, and they don't care about the cost. So that's a, not, that's a problem. I, st I don't think this happens again, but still, the space in uh, the the resources in space is limited. You see, in recent days, the Elon Musk or SpaceX uh, plans to launch more than 40,000 satellites into space. That will occupy a lot of resources that should be used by other countries and other companies. So I don't think that's reasonable. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you very much, Professor Yang Yiguang from the China Aerospace Science and Industry Group, and also from Denver, Dr. Andrew Audrin from the Audrin Space Institute joining us live there.